Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Paul, and this morning I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to do an introduction to the Urantia book, and this is for people who have never read the Urantia book or someone who has started reading the Urantia book and doesn't have any idea of the history behind where it came from, who, who was involved in it, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to give you some background of where the book came from, who it was uh, revealed to to start out with and what's been going on in the foundation since the uh, publishing of the book in 1955 but we're going to actually start uh, back at back in 1911 actually to 1906 to 1911 uh, with the history so having this information you can uh, get a better idea of where the book came from uh, the importance of it and that sort of thing I really feel that this is the most important book that you will ever read in your life. And that includes all the religious text, everything you can possibly imagine, including the Bible, because most of what's in the Bible that's spiritually important is in the Urantia book. OK, so if you say, well, I only read the Bible, well, we're going to enlighten you today uh, with some information. It's, a, it's really an update of information that you need to know to go on for your spiritual life. And this information is necessary for you to start out in the mansion worlds and go on your uh, your voyage to paradise. It's a wonderful, wonderful voyage that you're going to go on after you leave this world. Not only that, but the information in this book will, will give you in spiritual enlightenment to the point where it will help your life in your daily life. So uh, I know life sometimes is difficult and depressing, and, and it's a struggle, and it's meant to be a struggle. But reading this book, you see, you get start to get the overall picture of what you're supposed to learn in this life and uh, where you're going into the future. Uh, I'm going to start out, you're, I'm going to read a lot of quotes from the book itself, because the best information on where the book came from is in the book itself. So I'm going to read quite a few quotes. I have 80 slides. This slide uh, uh, program is uh, underneath the video, wherever it will be posted, uh, both YouTube, Vimeo, and, you can, and on our website. And then at the very end of this is a link to our website so you can get this information off our website also. But all 80 uh, slides in this presentation, you can download from the website. So just to let you know that. Uh, and I will not get through the but about half of it on this first video. In the second video, I will finish it up. Now, our plans is right now that I'm going to do the entire two sections, the, the whole video, just me talking, and then we're going to re-record uh, the video again in our study group so that people can ask questions. And uh, many people would like to read the entire thing or listen to the entire thing without any interruptions. And that's why I'm doing these recordings ahead of time. Okay, so let's get started. And we're gonna start with the very first slide um, this morning. And this is the uh, a slide in the book. And you'll notice at the very top, it says one, one. That's page one paragraph or paragraph one. And this section right behind it, this is the page from the original book, and then the paragraph, the pages and paragraph, or the papers and paragraphs from which I got these quotes from. So this is the forward, the very first section, and the very first paragraph. So let's get started with this this morning and see if we can't uh, give you give you a little bit of enlightenment this morning, improve your life, make your life better. Okay, here we go. In the minds of the mortals of Urantia, that being the name of your world, there exists great confusion respecting the meaning of such terms as God, divinity, and deity. Human beings are st still more confused and uncertain about the relationships of the divine personalities de designated by these numerous appellations. Because of this conceptual poverty associated with so much ideational, uh, ideational confusion, I have been directed to formulate this introductory statement, an explanation of the certain meanings which should be attached to certain world word symbols as they may be hereafter used in those papers which the Ervantan core of truth revealers have been authorized to translate 
and to the ang English language of your ranch. And you're going to find out through going through this paper that this revelation is to enlighten us on the different types of uh, beings that's in the cosmos. And e at each level, going down through the universe, they, they, the ancients of days have assigned different beings to reveal truth to us. And these different beings, there's a lot of different people writing these papers or individuals, I should say, not people, celestial beings. And each one of them have been assigned to this task because they're the highest authority on those particular subjects of the task. So that's why uh, that's why it's saying here that these this has been assigned by the Avorn, or Orvantan core of truth revealers. Orvantan is the seventh super universe. And ahead of that seventh super universe is the three ancients of days. There's three ancients of days for each of the seven super universe. So this is the highest authority they could get. And they're assigning this assignment from the ancients of days themselves and th and this particular slide is from the forward and the forward was done after the book was completely done to explain certain terms concerning god and divinity so that it kind of straightens us out on what divinity and god is now let's take a look at the book itself if you look at the covers of the book this is a uh the what they call the dust cover of the book, uh, which was one of the first things that, that I noticed when I got my book back in 1973. But the original book, they called it the blue book. This is an original 1955 book. Okay, the, there was only 10,000 of these printed when it was printed in 1955. And the interesting part about this is this. This is the very first printing, very old. And on the very first page, it says, what? First printing, all right? And it shows the four parts of the Urantia book. So if you can find one of these, you're very, very lucky. It took me years to find one. I think I paid $850 for this book because it was an original, all right? And there's 10,000 of them out there. So if you find one, you're very, very lucky. Now, I got my book in 1973. I mean, gave it to me when I was studying religion and philosophy. Uh, I was in college in the Navy, and my book, very worn, as you can see, this is a 1973 version, and I took the dust cover because I wore it out and cut it up and put it inside the book, as you can see, front and back, okay? You can also see in my book, in 1973, my version of the book, I took the Bible back then, because I was going to disprove the book. I, you know, I was a nice Southern Baptist. So my job was, I didn't believe anything that wasn't in the Bible, right? So you can see in this, I've got notes down each column through this book. What I did is I went through the entire book and the entire Bible and compared the two. There was a book out shortly after that called the Paramini, which you could compare the Urantia book to every single thing in the Bible. The Urantia book itself has multiple, multiple quotes for over a thousand quotes from different places, different philosophies, the, some of them the Bible, some of them other writings. So it incorporates as many human thoughts as it possibly can. Anything that we don't have thoughts about, then um, they use revelation. Okay. Also, on this particular uh, slide, you can see uh, the paperback version of the book. There's been many of these put out. I've given away hundreds of them, so you can get them uh, fairly inexpensively. Most of these are less than $20 now. When I originally bought my book, it was up to about 30 bucks just for the, the hardcover book. All right, so let's go to the next thing. Where did I get this information from that I'm going to show you today? Most of the information I got that I'm going to teach you today comes from either the Arantia book itself or this book right here. This is a book by a guy named Mary, uh, Larry Mullins, and uh, it has also Meredith Sprunger, who's like a very smart uh, minister, scholar, that sort of thing. They took the two previous histories of the Urantia book, combined them together, and came up with this. And this is a very big book. If you're a serious 
student of the Urantia book, you need to purchase one of these. You can get them on Amazon for fairly inexpensive. They also have it in the Kindle version, so you can read it in Kindle or Amazon. But most of the history part of what I'm going to teach you today came from this book right here. OK, uh, it is very, very good. I also have a, uh, a slide of Larry Mullen's other book about the life of Jesus. And you can see on this, they've taken the pictures from the uh, Jesus of Nazareth movie and incorporated it in the life of Christ. The Urantia book, the last third, the whole third of the book, several hundred pages, is the life of Christ. And he's taken that information and plugged in these pictures made it a very interesting read so him and his wife uh both were involved uh i think her name is joan mullins um in making this book uh, available so that people uh could read it see pictures kind of get a better idea of the, the life of jesus himself okay so that's what that's about. So most all of these, uh, I have pictures of people. I have some charts, a couple charts in here uh, from uh, Dr. Sadler. And these all came right directly from this book. I want to make sure that you understand that. So you can you can get a uh, idea where all this information came from. OK, so let's get started in the contact with the contact commission. What was the contact commission in 19... According to Dr. Sadler, 1911, they say in the histories from 1906 till 1911, but according to the history by Dr. Sadler himself, uh, in 1911, he made first contact with the, an individual that was used as a clearinghouse for celestial beings, okay? And this individual had no idea that that's what was happening, okay? Dr. Sadler was a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, a minister, very, very noted. Uh, he studied with Freud uh, over in Europe, and he was, Dr. Sadler was considered the father of psychiatry in the United States. He's got so many accolades, it's, it's unbelievable. But the original contact commission started in 1911 when Dr. Sadler and his wife, who was a, also a medical doctor, William Kellogg from the Kellogg fame, you know, Kellogg's cereal, Battle Creek, uh, that was William Kellogg, his brother, I think it is, that started that. And his wife, um, Anna Kellogg, uh, all four were involved in the original, con what they called the Contact Commission. They had six people they used uh, to contact through this individual and reveal this information for the world. The interesting part is this, the contact personalities would not talk to anyone unless there were at least two of the contact commission present. Okay, so this is very long and drawn out. The original makeup of the contact commission uh, consisted of William Sadler, his wife, Lena Sadler, Dr. Lena Sadler, Wilford and Anog Bell Kellogg, and eventually his stenographer, Emma Christensen, or they called her Christy, because she, she took notes d during this original context. And then later on, Bill Sadler Jr., who was about 16 when this started, but when he get, got out of the uh, Marine Corps, he became a full-time member of the Contact Commission himself. And we're going to find out a lot of information about these folks as we go through this. This is a picture of Dr. Sadler and Lena Sadler. Okay, and this, this one of Lena Sadler is from 1914, so it's close to that period of time. And this picture of William Sadler was fairly early, too. Now, on the slide itself... It breaks down into great detail the history of Dr. Sadler himself. He uh, he wrote many, many, many books. He was considered the father of psychiatry in the United States. He also uh, did a lot of work with, with psychic phenomena, disproving psychic phenomena, trying to prove what's real, opposed to what's not real, that sort of thing. He wrote many books on it. 
One of them uh, is called a mind at mischief, and we're gonna we're gonna go into that pretty detailed in a few minutes. But this is a who's who for Dr. Sadler uh, in 1942. They they put this out. So you can read through this. I'm not going to belay the, the thing, but he was born in 1875 and uh, he died much later. He was, he, he was very old when he died. But this is him and his wife uh, early on uh, in this period. Also, here is a picture of Annabelle Cal Cal Kellogg and Wilford Kellogg from 1942. And they were two, the other two contact commissioners, along with Christie down in this picture and William Sadler Jr. This is also a picture of Dr. Sadler later on in years as he got older. Okay, I thought that would be an interesting thing for so folks to see. And all of these pictures are out of Larry Mullen's book on on the history of the Urantia paper. So you can you can purchase that book and look at these very closely. This is a, another picture of Lena Sadler, as she got older, she she died in 1959, about four years after the book was published. And uh, this is Christy when she was younger. The other pictures we have of her, she's got she was pretty old when she died. So uh, that is this is what the contact commission looked like during that period of time. OK. So let's get started. Who are we? Where are we? Where are we in the universe? OK, I want to explain this picture. I put this slide in so that you get an overall view of the master universe and the outer space levels. OK, and this is a picture from above down. In reality, we can, cannot get a picture from above down, even if we wanted to, because the universe is so large, you could not get up high enough to see it all. Just paradise itself, this little thing in the center, is actually as big as the entire universe, okay, This in this picture. So the space it would take up to take the entire, all seven super universes, all the space levels, that space is the size of the area of paradise itself. So that's what that little circle is right in the middle. Now, if we had to make a picture of this, this big part, all of it would be the size of paradise. And outside that, it would double the triple to get the rest of it. OK, so it's kind of hard to get an idea what this really lo looks like. Also, this is from above down. If we were really looking at the universe, it would be exactly on its side and it would be very oval. So instead of a circle here, you would have a large, large oval. And if we're way out here in the seventh super universe, and if we looked in towards paradise, we would be looking straight through the Milky Way, all through billions and billions and billions of planets and worlds. Okay, so let me kind of explain what the rest of this picture is. These satellites or these planets that surround paradise are 21 satellites, seven for the Father, seven for the Son, and seven for the Infinite Spirit. And they have different functions, which I'm not going to go into. You have to read the book to get that. Also surrounding these seven satellites are what they call the worlds of Havona, the billion worlds of Havona, and they line up in seven rings. And it's interesting that on the outside of the billion worlds of Havona, there are two gravity belts, or they call them dark space bodies. So even if you could see in that, you couldn't see through the, there's so many of them through these dark space bodies because of what these things do is they balance the gravity of paradise and Havona so that the seven super universes don't crash into them, come crashing into them. But if you were looking from where we are, you would have to look through the whole entire seven super universe, the Milky Way, and then look through the dark space bodies through all billion worlds of Havona to get to paradise. Now, interesting part is this. We start way out here and our pathway to paradise is going through all, all uh, the whole seventh super universe. And then we start in in world number one of Havona and we go through every single planet to get to paradise eventually to meet God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. 
Now we start out on the mansion worlds, which is a whole different story. Okay. So uh, we start out in the seventh super universe and we work our way uh, in through paradise and eventually stand before God, the father. Now this is kind of a breakdown of the whole picture itself. First of all, there's seven super universes that surround Havona. In those seven super universes, it's divided up in major sectors, minor sectors, local universe, constellations, local systems, and inhabited planets. Okay. In that fact, this is a breakdown of what's how that's broken down. For instance, there's seven super universes, and inside those seven super universes are 70 major sectors. That's 10 for each of the seven super universes. And then there's 7,000 minor sectors, and that's 1,000 for each super universe. So you can see how this breaks down all the way down. Also, something very important is there's 700,000 local universes. Now, a local universe consists, consists of 10 million planets. Also, for each of the local universes, they are created by what's called a creator son. A creator son is the child of God the Father and the original Michael or God the Son. Okay, so God the Son and God the, the, the Father made up or cr created 700,000 creator sons, one for each of the 700,000 local universes. So our concept of Jesus, Jesus is a creator son, okay? One of 700,000 creator sons. Our local universe, everything we know in this local universe was created by Michael and the local universe mother spirit. Eventually there will be 10 million planets. Right now, our local universe is only a little bit over one third done. So there's quite a bit left to do for Michael to do creating universe. I mean, creating planets. So you say, what? Jesus is a creator son? Yeah, Jesus is a creator son. All 700,000 creator sons are called Michael in their local universe because they are the order of Michael, just like the original son. The original son, let me go back up here for a second. The original son created with the infinite spirit, created Havona. You see this area right here? That was the original universe. Okay. So the original son of God created this. All of these seven super universes has a hundred thousand local universes and each one of those were created by a creator son okay so that's where we are in the universe that's that's where we sit all right so we're going to go on to the next one the next important thing is this slide and we're, we're going to see these notations up in the corner of each one of these slides that come from the book and this is from page 234 paragraph one or paper 21 paragraph zero, I mean, uh, section zero, paragraphs one. Okay. The creator sons are their makers and the rulers of the local universes of time and space. These universe creators and sovereigns are of dual origin, embodying the characteristics of both God the Father and God the Son. But each creator son is different from every other. Each is unique in nature as well as in personality. Each is the only begotten son of the perfect deity ideal of his origin. So there's only one creator son in each local universe. And each one is the only begotten son for that universe from God the Father and God the Son. They're all unique, every single one of them. So each universe becomes what unique in itself because it's the creation of the creator son so you have to look at it this way our concept of god is really jesus it is michael or jesus whichever one you want to call him because he is the incarnation of god the father and god the son 
in our local universe and he created everything we know of so when we think of god it's more like jesus than it is god the father but his father is god the father and the interesting point is this god the father not only exists in paradise but god the father has taken it upon himself to be the only deity that instills a fragment of himself in each and every mortal throughout all seven super universes. Now, I need to mention one other thing before we move on. The seven super universes we see in this picture, these big seven super universes, are the only things that have human beings in it right now. The outer space levels, which are being developed, are not populated. There's no people out there yet. OK, and we have a very interesting perspective on our planet because we're on the very edge of the seventh super universe. So if we look in towards the Milky Way, we're looking right towards the seventh super universe. If we look opposite the Milky Way on our planet, we're actually looking out into the first outer space level. And because of our position in space, we can see billions and billions and billions of universes and planets being developed right now. Isn't that kind of nice? So we start in the farthest place out and we go in. All right. So the creator sons are the only begotten sons, right? This is a now remember, these are all statements from celestial beings that's been assigned to tell us this information. All right, let's go on. I do not know the exact number of creator sons in existence, but I have good reasons to believe that there are more than just 700,000. Now we know there are exactly 700,000 unions of days that the ordained plan of the present universe age seem to indicate that one union of days is to be stationed in each local universe as the counseling ambassador of the Trinity. We note further that the constantly increasing number of creator sons already exceeds the stationary number of the union of days. But concerning the destiny of the Michaels beyond 700,000, we have never been informed. They speculate that these other Michaels will be uh, creators out in the, the four outer space levels. Now, a union, an interesting part about the union of days is this. Our Michael son is number 211,121. That's his number. Our union of days that's assigned to this local universe, which is the representative of the Trinity in the local universe, his number is 211,121, too. They created simultaneously. The interesting part is this. For each creator's son, there is a mate. See, we don't know any about this, anything about this from the Bible because it's not in there. His mate is called a local universe mother spirit. She is created by the infinite spirit. She's the female influence of the universe, Michael being the male influence of the universe. And she co-created everything in this local universe now interesting point is this there is a local universe mother spirit for each creator son so that means there's 700,000 of those also and guess what her number is 211,121 so all three of these deities were created either at the same time or simultaneously after one another okay let's go on to the next great part of this information. Let me go down here in my other one. Other, I've got two slide programs going at uh, the same time. So I, cause some of this done is stuff's too small for me to read on one screen. Okay. So when a creator son is personalized by the universal father and the eternal son, then does third part of the Trinity, the infinite spirits individualize a new and unique representation of himself to accompany this creator son to the realms of space there to be his companion first in physical organization and later in creation and ministry to the creature creatures of the newly projected universe interesting fact michael helped create 
all the physical world along with the local universe mother spirit but the sons of god for the local universe are mostly created by michael himself the daughters of the universe are created by the local universe mother spirit so that means that every single angelic being from gabriel all the way down to the seraphim the Sanabim, the cherubim, all of the angels are created by the local universe mother spirit through the infinite spirit. Now, the interesting part about that is this, none of them are male. All of them are female. So they all have a female influence, even Gabriel at the very top. Even though his name's Gabriel, he's still of a female influence because he was created by the local universe mother spirit and all female entities are, are created by the local universe mother spirit now there's an exception to that because the material sons and daughters uh which we're not going to go a great deal into other than the fact that they become the adams and eves that the eves the, michael has uh input on that one too so but most all the female influence uh celestial beings are all created by the infinite spirit by herself all right so, I mean, the local universe mother spirit by herself, okay? So, here's the big picture. We have a Michael creator son that creates 10 million planets in the local universe. And we have a local universe mother spirit that co-creates all this with him. So, there's 700,000 Michaels, 700,000 local universe mother spirits and there's 700,000 unions of days that are the influence or the oversight of the trinity okay another interesting point coming up here this is going to straighten out a lot of things in that you don't understand about where jesus came from okay before the events I'm about to de delineate, Michael of Nebadon, that's our local local creator, that's Jesus, had bestowed himself six times after the similitude of six differing orders of his diverse creation of intelligent beings. Then he prepared to descend upon Urantia in the likeness of mortal flesh, the lowest order of his intelligent will creatures. And as such, a human of the material realm to execute the final act of the drama of acquirement of universe sovereignty in accordance with the mandates of the divine paradise rulers of the universe of universes. And who would that be? That would be the ancients of days. So every single creator son, in order to claim full sovereignty, of their local universe. All right, before they do this, their local universe still is the complete over control of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. By earning this sovereignty, they can run their local universe any way they see fit, but they all choose to still stay under the, the sovereignty of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But in order to claim this sovereignty, they have to live a complete life from birth to death in all seven types of beings that they create in their local universe. So our, our Michael or our Jesus lives six other lives as other types of beings that he had created from birth to death six times, six different types of beings before he came to earth. Now, when he came to earth, his final bestowal had to be as a babe. In other words, he had to be born a baby, just like every other baby. And he had to live an entire life all the way to full fruition and die just like we do. So the experience he gains from doing the seven bestowals, he experiences birth to death in every type of being that he's created. So when he came to the planet, when he came, when he was born by uh, a, a son of Joseph and Mary, he did not have memory of his previous existence until his baptism. Okay, this is very important. So his experience from a baby all the way up to his baptism was just like me or you. His he got experience of being a normal human. He was hungry. He got sick. 
He had all the experiences that we have all the way up until his, his baptism. And at that point, he had finished his obligation of his bestowal less one point, and that is dying as a human being. And that which he did on the cross. Okay, he died the most terrible death you could think of. So he experienced everything that a normal human would experience, including a horrible, horrible death. Okay, so by doing this, each and now remember, all 700,000 creator sins has to do the same thing on the, their universe. And they're at different places throughout the universe, how this is progressing. Now, we're fortunate because our Michael or our Jesus has finished all this. Now, the interesting point is this 200,000 years ago, which most people don't know anything about Lucifer, our system sovereign, rebelled. And when he rebelled, he took 37 planets into rebellion with him. And at that point, we were put, and the 37 planets were put in quarantine. So up to that point, our planet could communicate outside the planet, would get heavenly broadcast and all this stuff. 200,000 years ago, we got cut off, okay? And not only... Did Lucifer rebel? Satan, his first lieutenant, rebelled, and Satan went around to the planets and got 37 planets to rebel, and our planetary prince rebelled with him. Okay, so that's how we got in the mess we're in. There were six or 100 beings that were on the planet that were from our local system capital. They were called the Caligasta 100, 50 males, 50 females. And they were here 500,000 years ago to train us in basic things like social social things and learning how to uh, speak to one another, uh, learning a basic language, learning the concept of God. And the Caligasta 100 was the very first, uh, what they call, epical revelation of God to man. But 60 of these beings went into rebellion. OK, so we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So all the creator sons have to go through the same process of bestowing themselves as a human being. Now, our Michael has finished that. Our Michael has finished his bestowal. And so that makes him the supreme sovereign of this universe. All right, let's keep going. But make no mistake, Christ Michael, while truly dual origin being, was not a double personality. He was God and man, all right? He was not God in association with man, but rather God incarnate in man. And he was always just that combined being, the only progressive factor in such a non-understandable relationship was the progressive self-conscious realization and recognition by the human mind, this is the Jesus, of the fact of being God and man. So he had to go through the self-conscious realization as who he was as he grew older. Now, another interesting part about this is that he was not only God and man, but he was a dual origin being. How's that? He was His origin came from God the Father and God the Son. So that's a dual origin. All right. But in that fact, he was also a dual origin being in, in that he was not only human, but he was also divine. Okay. Let's keep going. No mortal can presume to know how the Urantia papers were materialized. Dr. Sadler act, actually often declared everything that is known about the materialization process can be found in the Urantia papers. Recall that we have no record of any member of the contact commission actually witnessed the materialization of any written material of any kind. Now, what's it saying here? Let me go on. Uh, we have no testimony that any contact commissioner are observed any miraculous event associated with the materialization of the revelation. There were apparently no so-called psychic processes or events used. Why is this important? They're not claiming that some golden tablets was left to somebody and somebody else interpreted in them and that turned into a book. Okay, that's not what happened here. 
you know, there were no gold tablets. God, God doesn't care whether something's gold or silver or anything else. God's no respecter of persons. Materials doesn't matter to God the Father. Okay, this is, that's just the way it is. But the what they're telling us here is the materialization process of the papers themselves was not witnessed, was not tampered by any human being. Now, an interesting part of this is this you need to understand. From 1911 till 1924, the contact with the contact person was to train the six members of the contact commission for the preparation of receiving the papers themselves so when christy was there taking notes and stuff these notes that she took was for the contact commission themselves to educate them on what they needed to know when the papers arrived to bring it to the groups and start to get it started really more than anything else so the stuff that christy wrote down was not the paper okay it's important to understand that when they got the paper, they got the paper in a material form, written, handwritten in pencil, okay, the first three parts of the paper, handwritten in pencil, and then Christie, after 1923-24, transposed that type, written papers into a type manuscript, okay, she didn't add anything to it. She didn't take anything away. She just typed the thing up, okay? But no one knows how those papers, handwritten, got here. Other than the fact that one day when they went to see the sleeping subject, it, it was there. It appeared, okay? They tested the sleeping subject's hands and everything else to see if he could have possibly wrote it, and he didn't. And then they did got a handwriting expert in, several of them in, to test the handwriting on the papers to see if it was his, and it wasn't. Okay? So, and this is because of Dr. Sadler. He, doubt, he, he doubted everything that happened, right? He was a, he was a psychic debunker. And, uh, he w w did this along with, with uh, Harold Thurston, I believe it in, and Houdini was involved with this. He did this a lot too, because Thurston was a magician, so he knew every trick in the book. So they tried to disprove this as they went. Dr. Sadler was not convinced of the book until it was actually published in somewhere around 19, between 1942 and 1955. The book was published in 55. Okay, so what they're telling us here is none of the contact commission actually witnessed anything when the book appeared. All right. They didn't see anything more than we did. And the reason they did this is they didn't want any human being associated with the revelation. They didn't want a revelation like everything else in the world is where somebody, this is somebody's idea of, of how God is, what it is, and that sort of thing. It's not like the Bible. You know, you, you know the Bible was written, some of it inspired, some of it not so inspired, but all the books of the Bible was written by men. So it's their concepts of, of religion. This is not that. This is a revelation of God to man, and also included in that is our history, the entire history of Jesus himself and everything that's happened that's that's of importance on our planet. So that now you can see why this book is so important to read. Okay, I have something very special with coming up with this next slide. I want to talk about in in 1929, Dr. Sadler was debunk was had been debunking psychics and things like that for years. And he wrote a book, it was called Minds at Mischief. And this is all the different types of psychic things, all the mental things people had gone through. He was familiar with every type of psychic phenomena you could possibly imagine. And he wrote a book. Uh, and in the end of the book, he added what's called an appendix. And it's interesting that this appendix, what I'm going to read to you, was in the first publication of the book. And some, for some reason, after the first publication, it disappeared. The appendix did. So if you can find an original Minds at Mischief by Dr. William Sadler from 1929, you will find the appendix. 
But if you can't find the original, you won't ever see the appendix again. And fortunately, I have a copy of the three pages of the appendix. And I'm going to take the time to read this because you can't find this information hardly anywhere. So let's read the slide first. Appendix from the Mind at Mischief, Dr. William Sadler, Editor's Note. The following was written by Dr. William Sadler in 1929 as an appendix to his book, The Mind at Mischief. Dr. Sadler is known to have been intimately involved in the process which resulted in the publication of the Urantia book. It is the opinion of some individuals that the sleeping subject to which he refers into this appendix, along with the phenomena associated with this person, is the description of the process by which the content of the Urantia book came into the possession of Dr. Sadler and the Contact Commission. That's the introduction. And I'm going to read the actual text of this to you. And if you want a copy of this, you'll have to contact me or co contact Larry Mullins because that's where this is from. In discussions of fraudulent mediums. Now, let me let me tell you a little bit about this before we get started. This first couple paragraphs is about one other instance which Dr. Sadler believed could have possibly been true. The only other one he believed was true was the contact commission for the Urantia book. The, this is the other one that he did. In discussion of fraudulent mediums and self-deceived psychics, the reader of this book has several times encountered the statement that there were certain exceptions to the general indictments they're made and was referred to this appendix. I now It now becomes my duty, this is Dr. Tad Sadler, to explain what I had in mind when those footnotes were inserted. In the interest of scientific accuracy on one hand and of strict fairness on the other, it becomes necessary to explain that there are one or two exceptions to the general statement that all cases of psychic phenomena which have come under my observation have turned out to be those of autopsychism. This is a doctor that does nothing but deals with um, psychological things as a psychiatrist and mental illness, things like that, okay? It is true that practically all the physical phenomena have proved to be fraudulent. While the psychic phenomena are most always invariably explainable by the laws of psychic projection, transference, reality shifting, etc. But many years ago, I did meet one trans medium, a woman now deceased, whose visions, revelations, etc. were not tainted with spiritualism. As far as my knowledge extends, at no time did she claim to be under the influence of spirit guides or controls or to communicate messages from spirits of departed human beings. Her work was largely of a, of a religious nature and consisted of elevated sayings of, uh, and religious admonitions. I never had the privilege of making a thoroughgoing psychic analysis of this case, and I am not in position to express myself as the extent of which her revelations originated in the subconscious realms of her own mind. I make mention of this case merely to record the fact that I have met one instance of psychic phenomena, apparently of the trance order that was not in any way associated with spiritualism. This has nothing to do with the Urantia book. This is one person he met before when he was disproving uh, spiritualism and um, psychic phenomena. The other exception, this is, is about the Urantia book. On the other exception has to do with a rather peculiar case of psychic phenomena, which I find myself unable to classify, I which in which and which I would very like much like to narrate more fully. I cannot do so here, however, because of the promise which I feel under obligation to keep sacredly. In other words, I have promised not to publish the case during the lifetime of the individual. I hope sometime to secure a modification of that promise. That's because they had to take an oath. They wouldn't reveal anything about the, the, the person. 
and be able to report this case more fully because of the interesting features I was brought in contact with it in the summer of 1911. That's where I get my date, okay? I have had it under observation more or less ever since. This is 18 years. I have present, at present, probably 250 night sessions, many of which have been attended by a stenographer who made voluminous notes. That was Christy. A thorough study of this case has convinced me that it is not one of or ordinary trance. While the sleep seems to be quite of a natural order, it is very profound, and so far we have never been able to awaken the subject when the state, when in this state, but the body is never rigid, the heart action is never modified. Remember, he's an MD. Though respiration is sometimes markably interfered with, this man is utterly unconscious, wholly oblivious to what takes place, and unless told about it subsequently, never knows that he has been used as some sort of clearinghouse for the coming and going of alleged extraplanetary personalities. In fact, he is more or less indifferent to the whole proceeding and shows a surprising lack of interest in these affairs as they occur from time to time. In no way are these night visitations like the seances associated with spiritualism. At no time during the period of 18 years observation has there been a communication from any source that claims to be of a spirit of a deceased human being. No people, all right? The cum communications which have been written or which have been I, we have had the opportunity to hear spoken are made by a vast order of alleged beings who claim to come from other planets to visit this world, to stop here as student visitors for study and observation when they are en route from one universe to another or from one planet to another. These communications further arise in alleged spiritual beings who support purport to have been assigned to this planet for duties of various sorts. 18 years of study and careful investigations have failed to reveal the psychic origin of these message. I find myself at the present time just where I was when I started. Psychoanalysis, hypno hypno hypnotism, intensive comparison fail to show the written or spoken messages of this individual have origin in his own mind. Much of the material secured through this subject is quite contrary to his habits of thoughts, to the way in which he had been taught, and to his entire philosophy. In fact, much that of that which we have secured, we have failed to find anything in its nature in existence. Its philosophic content is quite new, and we are unable to find where very much of it has ever been found in human expression. Much of what I would like to report in details of this case, I am not in position to do at present. I can only say that I have found in these years of observation that all the information imparted through this source has proved to be consistent within itself. Well, there is considerable difference in the quality of the communications. This seems to be reasonably explained by a different in state of development and order of the personalities making the communications. In philosophy, its philosophy is consistent. It is essentially Christian and on whole entirely harmonious with the known scientific facts and truths of this age. Remember, he was a minister, trained as a minister. In fact, this case is so unusual. One more paragraph. Arc extraordinary that it is establishes itself immediately as far as my experience goes as a class by itself one of which thus far resistant to all my efforts to prove it to be auto psychic origin our investigations are being continued and as i have intimidated i hope sometime in the near future to secure permission for the more complete reporting of the phenomena connected with this interesting case. Now, remember, this is 1929. The actual book was started to be revealed in 1924. So they had been observing this person for 18 years and being trained. Okay, why is this important? 
because this is the being in which they say that the contact commission used to get the information. Now, important point, since we're talking about the mind at mischief, at mischief and Dr. Sadler disproving psychics phenomena, they gave him permission to explain in his writings what was not used to put the book through. Okay, and that's what I'm going to read you his list. It's a little, just a little bit more. Well, we are asked, let me make this a little bit bigger for myself here so I can read it. Okay. Well, we are not at liberty to tell you even the little we know about the technique of the production of the Urantia papers. We are not forbidden to tell you how we did not get these documents. Let me call your attention to the following outline of present day psychologic and psychic phenomena. That's what's on this. So you can enlarge this at home when you have time. Unusual activities of the marginal consciousness, the subconscious mind. These are the things that are were not used for the Urantia book. Automatic writing, number one. Number two, automatic talking, speaking in tongues. Uh, trance mediumships, spirit mediumships. Can't read this one. Cat, cat, cat up, see, see. Don't know what that is. Three, automatic hearing, clairvoyance, hear, hearing voices, automatic seeing, number four. Dream states, twilight mentations, visions, automatic dramatizations, hallucinations, shifting reality and feelings. Five, automatic thinking, automatic fearing, anxiety, neurosis, automatic ideation, mental compulsions, automatic judgments, intuition, hunches, automatic association of ideas, premonitions, automatic guessing, ESP, extrasensory perception. Automatic deductions, delusions, paranoia, uh, dominance by marginal consciousness, dreams, and hypnosis. Remember, this guy's a psychiatrist. Six, automatic remembering, clairvoyance, automatic memory associations. Didn't come from the past. Telepathy, mind reading, fortune telling, largely fraudulent. Musical and mathematical marvels. Number seven, automatic acting, automatic behavior, major hysteria, witchcraft. Automatic motion, motor compulsions, automatic overdrives, manic episodes, automatic walking. Okay, that's blurry. Sim, symbolism, something like that. No, you have to enlarge that one for yourself. Eight, automatic personalization, automatic forgetting, amnesia, automatic disassociation, double and multiple personalities, schizophrenia, schizophrenia. Split personalities, number nine, combined and associated, associated psychic states. The technique of the reception of the Uran Chabuk in English in no way parallels or impinges upon any of the above phenomena of the marginal consciousness. Dr. Sadler's list of psychic phenomena that were not used to materialize the Urantia papers. And this source of this came from the considerations of critics of the Urantia book Dr. Sadler wrote himself in 1958. Okay, so this is all the things that were not associated with bringing the Urantia book into our lives. Okay, let me go back down here. I had to go back to my smaller version and it clicks me back to the start. Okay, here we go. Statement of authorship. This is an acknowledgement from the Urantia book. And you'll see here up at the corner, this is from page 16, paragraph 8. This is in the still in the force. This is the very end of the forward of the book. This is the very last thing they wrote on the book, which is kind of interesting because Dr. Sadler... William Sadler and, and Bill Sadler Jr. wrote a forward to the book that they wanted to use in the book, and, they, and the celestial beings wouldn't let them. He said it'd be like the kinder, kindergarten student trying to write a forward to a uh, college manual. <laughs> so I guess they got the picture. 
All right. Acknowledgement. In formulating the succeeding presentations having to do with the portrayal and of the character of the universal father and the nature of the paradise associates, together with an attempt description of the perfect central universe and the encircling seven super universes, we are to be guided by the mandates of the super universe rulers. Rulers which directs that we shall, in all of our efforts to reveal truth and coordinate essential knowledge, give preference to the highest existing human concepts pertaining to the sub subjects to be presented. We may resort to the pure revelation only when the concept of presentation has no adequate process, previous expression by the human mind. So they used over a thousand human concepts in the book to, so we would understand, but they only use pure revelation when there were no human concepts to reveal what they wanted to tell us, okay? Successive planetary revelations of divine truth invariably embrace the highest existing concepts of spiritual values as a part of a new and enhanced coordination of planetary knowledge accordingly and making these presentations about God and his universe associates, we have selected as the basis of these papers more than 1,000 human concepts representing the highest and most advanced planetary knowledge of spiritual values and universe meanings, wherein these human concepts assembled from the God-knowing mortals of the past and the present we are inadequate to portray the truth we are directed to reveal it. We will unhesitatingly supplement them for the purpose of drawing upon our own superior knowledge of the reality and divinity of the paradise deities and their transcendent residential universe. So they only use their superior knowledge when they can't find a human concept that will fit in there. We are fully cognizant of the difficulty of our assignment. We recognize the impossibility of full of finite concepts of the mortal mind. But we know that there dwells within human mind, this is important, a fragment of God. In other words, each one of us has a fragment of God within us. And there sir, joins the human soul, the spirit of truth, of course, the Holy Spirit, and we further know that these spirit forces can conspire to be, enable material man to grasp the reality of spiritual values and comprehend the philosophy of universe meanings. But even more certainly, we know that these spirits of the divine present are able to assist man in the spiritual appropriation of all truth contributory to the hand enhancement of an ever-progressing reality of personal religious experience, God-knowingness or consciousness. Indicted by a Ravantan divine counselor, chief of the super-universe personalities assigned to portray on your answer the truth concerning the paradise deities and the universe of the universes. So this is a base, basically a acknowledgement that They've given us this information. They've, re they've resorted to revelation only when there were no human concepts to tell us what they wanted us to know. Okay, now each one of these next three or four slides is from the end or the beginning of the four sections of the Urantia book. And the reason I put these in here, it tells you who was assigned to write these and why they did it. Okay, the next one. This is at the end of the first section. It says, presented by a divine counselor, a member of a group of celestial personalities assigned by the ancient of days of Uversa. Uversa is the seventh super universe, or the, the capital of the seventh super universe, the headquarters of the seventh super universe to supervise those portions of this forthcoming revelation with having to do with the affairs beyond the borders of the local universe of Nebadon. That's our universe. I am commissioned to sponsor those papers portraying the nature and attributes of God because I represent the highest source of information available for such a purpose 
on any inhabited world. I have served as a divine counselor in all seven super universes and have long resided at the paradise center of all things. Many times I have enjoyed the supreme pleasure of a sojourn in the immediate personal presence of the universal father. I portray the reality and truth of the father's nature and attributes with unchallengeable authority. I know whereof I speak. In other words, there's no one higher than this guy to tell us about God the Father. Okay, pretty serious, isn't it? This is uh, more on, this is from paper 31, uh, the last paragraph. Jointly sponsored by a divine counselor and one without name and number. And that is a, that's a human being that's gone all the way to paradise and gotten so high, they not, not they don't even refer him to it with a name and number anymore. But that's how high he's got. Author, authorized so to function by the ancients of days on Uversa. These 31 papers de depicting the nature of deity and the reality of paradise, the organization and workings of the central and super universes, the personalities of the grand universe, and the high destiny of evolutionary mortals were sponsored, formulated, and put into English by a high commissioner consisting of 24 Arvantan administrators acting in accordance with a mandate issued by the ancients of days of Uversa, directing that we should do this on Urantia, our planet, 606 of Satania, where there's 606 planet in Satania at a 619, eventually there'll be a thousand, or number 606 in Satania, in Norlachidek, that's our constellation of Nebadon, our local universe, and the year 1935. I need to explain one other thing here. Satania is our local system. It's not, it's not named after Satan. People ask me that all the time. Satan was named after Satania as the first, uh, the first assistant to Lucifer, who was the head of, he was the, the sovereign of Satania at one time. He's been replaced by Lanaforge now because of the rebellion. But our planet, Urantia, or Earth, 606 of Satania, our local system, in Norlachidek, that's our constellation of Nebadon. There's 100 constellations in Nebadon, Nebadon in the year 1934. See why I have to explain everything in great detail, detail right? Okay. This section was from the uh, second section. Uh, notice here, this is paper 56, paragraph, or section 10, paragraph 22, page 648. Presented by a mighty messenger visiting on Urantia. A message by request of the Nebulon core, revelatory core, in collaboration with certain Melchizedek of Vicegerent Planetary Prince of Urantia. Now, we need to explain who this is. Makovitch of Melchizedek came and revealed God to man. He was the third epical revelation. After he'd done that, Michael came and revealed uh, God to man again in his life. But because Michael, or Jesus, uh, finished his sovereignty, he automatically became the planetary prince of the Urantia, and he could not hold that position and along at the same time be the sovereign of the universe. So he gave that job to the best person he could find or best being he could find, which would be Mac eventual Melchizedek. Okay. So he is our vice gerent planetary prince. He stands in, in lieu of Michael. Okay. And as our planetary prince, they assigned another Melchizedek as the revelatory core to do this job. All right, so this paper on universal unity is the 25th of a series of presentation by various authors, having been sponsored as a group by a commission of Nebadon personalities, that is the local universe personalities numbering 12, acting under the direction of Manchusa Melchizedek. He's in charge of this group. 
We indicted these narratives and put them into the English language by a technique authorized by our superiors in the year 1934 of Urantia time. So that's when it came. Okay. Here's another one. This is from uh, at the very end of the third section, paper 119. And this is paper 119 tells us all about the six previous bestowals of Michael become before he came to earth as Jesus. This paper depicting the seven bestowals of Christ Michael, they call him Christ Michael because we named him the Christ as he was on this earth. Christ Michael is the 63rd of a series of presentations sponsored by numerous personalities narrating the history of Urantia down to the time of Michael's appearance on earth in the likeness of mortal flesh. This paper, these papers were authorized by a Nebanon commission of 12 acting under the direction of Mantusha, Mantusha Melchizedek. We indicted these narratives and put them in the English language by a technique authorized by our superiors in the year 1935 of Urantia time so this is right at the end of 34 this got done in the early 30 1935 okay gives you a lot of information now the next paper is paper 120 and this begins the life of christ itself so the last one from 120 to paper 196 is all about the life of jesus okay and this is where how it starts out assigned by gabriel Gabriel is the chief angel in Nebadon, our local universe. He is, he's the top executive under Michael himself. He is an angel, okay? And he's in charge of the entire core of angelic hosts, all the angelic armies, the seraphim, the sanabim, the cherubim, all the different angels uh, in our local universe assigned by Gabriel to supervise the restatement of the life of Michael when on Urantia in the likeness, uh, likeness of mortal flesh. I, the Melchizedek, Melchizedek director of the Re Revelatory Commission, entrusted with this task, am authorized to present this narrative of certain events which immediately preceded the Creator Son's arrival on Urantia to embark upon the terminal phase of his universe bestowal experience to live such identical lives as he imposes upon the intelligent beings of his own creation. Thus to bestow himself in the likeness of his various orders of created beings is a part of the price which every creator son must pay for the full and supreme sovereignty of his self-made universe of things and be beings. So this tells us that every single Michael has to do the same thing. Okay. Go on to the next one. This is at the beginning of the life of Christ. Acting under the supervision of a commission of 12 members of the United Brotherhood of Midwayers. And we're going to talk about Midwayers in a little more, more detail in just a minute. conjointly sponsored by the preceding order, head of order of the Melchizedek of Record. Record, I am the secondary midwayer of one-time attachment to the Apostle Andrew. I am authorized to place on record the narrative of the life transactions of Jesus of Nazareth, as they were observed by my order of earth creatures as they were subsequently partially recorded by the human subject of my temporal guardianship, knowing how his master so scrupulously avoided leaving written records behind him. Andrew steadfastly refused to multiply copies of his written record, a similar attitude on the part of the other apostles of Jesus greatly delayed the writing of the Gospels. The first Gospel wasn't written until 67 AD. Okay? So all the Gospels had not been written because Jesus encouraged these people not to write anything down because that was his charge as the, the bestowal because he knew that anything that was written down, they would try to idolize just like they do, do the Bible right now, 
Okay, so they knew this was going to happen. All right, let me explain who the Urantia Brotherhood Midwayers are. There are two orders of midwayers. When the Caligasta 100 came to the planet 500,000 years ago, there were 50 females and 50 males volunteered from Jerusalem, a system capital, to come to the planet and help uplift all of the barbarians in that during that period of time to social, help teach them show, social things, gardening, how to treat meat and stuff, how to feed themselves, that sort of thing. They also revealed God to them in lessons, okay? During that period of time, Caligasta ordered the 50 to try to come up uh, to mate in a non-sexual manner. In other words, come together intellectually. And in doing so, they created 50 midwayers. These are in, invisible beings on a higher spiritual level. They, the reason they're called midwayers, they're midway, between human and Marantia. And to understand that, you need to understand that there are three levels of reality in the universe. There's the basically the material reality, there's the Marantia reality, and the spiritual reality. However, all three of these realities live on physical planets, okay? But the Marantia reality is attuned outside our sight. So we can't see Marantia beings. We can't see spiritual beings. They're even higher. So the midwayers are beings, the higher, the primary midwayers are between physical or material and the marancha. They're in between the two. The primary midwayers are higher up than the secondary midwayers. Well, where did the secondary midwayers come from? First, there were 50,000 of the primary midwayers. When we went into rebellion 200,000 years ago, 40,000 of them rebelled, 10,000 stayed loyal, a little bit over 10,000 or under 10,000, one of the two. The secondary midwayers were created by Adam and Eve's son and one of the Nodite descendants from Caligasta 100. And when they mated and had children, every fourth child they had was invisible. It was a secondary midwayer. And since it was closer to human beings, the secondary midwayers were close and closer to material. And the secondary midwayers could make themselves visible to human beings if they chose to. Okay. So that's where the secondary midwayers. And there were over there were 2,000, a little over 2,000 of them. Out of those, only 1,111 stayed loyal during the Lucifer after the Lucifer Rebellion. So, basically, the United Brotherhood of Midwayers are the loyal primary midwayers and the loyal secondary midwayers. And the, the, the rumor is that in around 1300 AD, the secondary midwayers as a group petition Jesus to be able to retell the story of his life. So because it was so uh, segmented from the New Testament, you know, all the story was never told. So it took all those years, Jesus finally decided he wanted us to know the real truth story of his life. So he petitioned the ancients of days to be allowed to, to have the secondary midwayers retell the story of his life as complete they could. And they only got to tell about a third of his story. There's two thirds that they, they're just too much information for them to tell. But the story we have in the Urantia book is Jesus's life from the time he was born to the time he was died. And in many places, day to day, it tells every place he went, everything that they could that he done and get it in that one third section of it so it's the secondary midwayers 12 of them that recorded everything that happened during jesus life and what we have in the urantia book is a retelling of the story and they used andrew's gospel they used all the gospels as basis to make sure that everything in those gospels are also told in the urantia book okay a lot of information isn't it we're going moving right along we're going to get about halfway through these today. Evolutionary revolution, rev, 
religion is sentimental, not logical. In other words, our evolutionary uh, religion has always been non non logical. It's not logical. It's a, man's reaction to a belief in a hypothetical ghost spirit world. The human belief reflex, excited by the realization and fear of the unknown. We we got our religion from fear. First, we feared God. Then we filled all the midwares that appeared in, as devils and demons. They're all gone now. They were taken away at Pentecost. But that's how our basis of religion started. Revelatory religion, however, is profound, propounded by the real spirit world. It is the response of the super intel, intellectual cosmos to the mortal hunger to believe in and depend on upon the universal deities. Evolutionary religion pictures the circuitous gropings of humanity in quest of truth. Revelatory religion is that very truth. There have been many events of religious revelation, but only five epical significance. They were as follows. I'm going to read all five to you in a second. The, what they're telling us is this. The revelation that's come in between and before the five epical revelations are things that's been revealed to men through inspiration. And all the writings we have are men's inspiration of what they believe their concepts of religion and philosophy and God are. Okay, so except for these five epical revelations, all the other revelations are the statements of men so what you have in the bible is what men telling you what they think is what's in the urantia book is celestial beings telling you the truth of what is and there's been five of these epical revelations of god to man and they were the first one was the dalmatia teachings this is where caligastra and the 100 came 500,000 years ago and taught about God. Now that went on for 300,000 years and ended when Lucifer rebelled 200,000 years ago. See, they mentioned these people in the Bible, but you have no idea who they were or anything else. And the whole story is told to you in the Urantia book. The second revelation of God to man was Eden when Adam and Eve came to the planet. Now this was after the rebellion. Okay. They came to the planet they were supposed to be Adam and Eve for our planet for going on indefinitely, but they defaulted in their mission after 200 years. So even the second revelation of God to man, in essence, failed, right? In some ways, it, it was successful in some ways, but some ways it failed. The third epical revelation of God to man was Machaventure Melchizedek, 1980 years before Christ, the the teachings of the Sethite priests who were the descendants of Adam and Eve, Seth was. So the Sethite priests came from Seth. They went out and taught the concepts of God all over the world. And this message that they were teaching, teaching was dying out about 1900 years before Christ. So they had an emergency son of God, which is a Machavention Melchizedek, come down and refresh the concepts of God the Father. And he taught Abraham. So Abraham, uh, or Abram, who became Abraham, uh, got these concepts of God the Father, and he taught it to the Bedouins and their descendants, and half of them, one of his sons taught the, the Jewish faith, and the other son taught the Muslim faith. So all the religions after that came from those original teachings of Melchizedek, okay? Then the fourth one was the teaching of Jesus, Jesus himself. That was the fifth epical revelation of God. And finally, the, the fifth epical revelation is these papers themselves. Now, we're going to go through each one of these with a little bit of information so that you kind of understand what we're talking about here. All right. This won't take all that long. Number one, the Dalmatian teachings. The true concept of the first source and center, God the Father, that's why they call him the first source and center of everything, was first promulgated on Urantia by the 100 corporal members of Prince Caligasta's staff. 
This expanding revelation of deity went on for more than 300,000 years until it was suddenly terminated by the planetary secession and the disruption of the teaching regime. Except for the work of Van, who was one of the loyal 100, and Amidon, which was his assistant, the influence of the Dalmatian revelation was practically lost to the whole world. Even the Nodites, the Nodites were the descendants of Nod, one of the Caligaster 100 who rebelled with 60 others. The Nodites had forgotten this truth by the time of Adam's arrival. Remember, Rada was a great, great, great granddaughter of one of the Nodites who, who married Adam's son, who was Adam's and Eve's son. And that's where the secondary midwayers came from. Had, even the Nodites had forgotten this truth by the time of Adam's arrival. Of all who received the teachings of the 100, the red man held them the longest. But the idea of the great spirit was but a hazy concept in a merry Indian religion when contact with Christianity greatly clarified and strengthened it. Why is that? Because the great spirit is God. All right. And our God is whom? Jesus. What was Christianity about? Jesus, right? That's why it strengthened it so much. Next, the Edenic teachings. This is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve again portrayed the concept of the father of all evolutionary peoples. The disruption of the first Eden halted the course of the Edenic revelation before it had ever really fully started. But the aborted teachings of Adam were carried on by the Sethite priest. Remember, Seth was one of the sons of Adam. And some of these truths have never been entirely lost to the world. The entire trend of Levantine, Levantine religion evolved, evolution was modified by the teachings of the Sethites. But by 2500 BC, mankind had largely lost sight of the revelation sponsored by the days of Eden. So it had just about disappeared. Melchizedek of Salem, this emergency son of Nebadon, inaugurated the third revelation of truth on Urantia. The cardinal precepts of his teachings were trust and faith. He, tr he taught trust is the omnipotent benefits benefits of God and proclaimed that faith was the act by which men earn God's favor, faith only. All you have to do is believe in God. That's all you need. His teachings gradually commingled with the beliefs and practices of various evolutionary religions and finally developed in those theologic systems present on Urantia at the opening of the first millennium after Christ. Okay? So you see the importance of what he did before Christ got here. He prepared the road just like uh, just like uh, John the Baptist did for Jesus to come. Fourth, Jesus of Nazareth. Christ Michael, they call him Christ Michael because we called him Jesus Christ. So he is the Christ of the world. And he originally was Michael. Presented for the fourth time to Urantia the concepts of God as the universal father. And this teaching has greatly persisted ever since. The essence of his teaching was love and service. The loving worship of a creator, creator son voluntary gives in recognition of and response to the loving ministry of God, his father. The three free will service of such creature sons bestow upon their brethren and the joyous realization that in this service, they are likewise serving God. This is exactly what Jesus taught us when he was on the planet. The fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. By serving each other and teaching each other, we are serving God. So you want to help your, brother, your brothers and sisters? You're doing the work of God when you do that. That's what's so, why it's so important. God, Jesus was God incarnate. He is an example of the personality of God. And finally, what do we have? We have number five, the Urantia papers. That's what we're talking about. Now you see the importance of why it's important for you to read this. 
The Urantia papers, of which this is one, constitutes the most recent presentation of truth to the mortals of Urantia. These papers differ from all previous revelations, for they are not the work of a single universe personality, but a composite presentation of many beings. But no revelation short of attainment of the universal father can ever be complete. All other celestial ministrations are no more than partial, transient, and practically adapted to local conditions in time and space. While such admissions as this may possibly detract from the immediate source and authority of all revelations, the time has arrived on Urantia when it is advisable to make such frank statements, even in the risk of weakening the future influence and authority of this, the most recent of the revelations of truth to the mortal races of Atlant Urantia. So what it's telling us, this is not the last revelation of God to man. There will be many, many more over uh, long periods of time. Okay. Also, I want to go through this one. This talks about the United Midwayers. Remember I said there's two groups of Midwayers, the primary and the secondary? Well, this is about both groups. The United Midwayers of Urantia are organized for service with the planetary seraphim in accordance with their innate endowments and acquired skills in the following groups. Midway messengers, this group bear names that they're, they're a small core and are of great assistance in the evolutionary world in the service of quick and reliable personal communications. These are probably primaries. Planetary sent sentinels, midwayers are the guardians and sentinels of the worlds of space. They perform the important duties of observers for all numerous phenomena and types of communication, which, which are of import to the supernatural beings of the realm. They pat patrol the invisible spirit realm of the planet. They know everyone that comes and goes in the spirit realm. They also know everyone that comes and goes in the physical realm. So if you, all these UFOs, they know all about them. All right. Three, the contact personalities. These are the personalities that brought us this revelation. And the contacts made with the mortal beings of the material world, such as with the subject through whom these communications were transmitted, the midway creatures are always employed. They are a, an essential factor in such liaisons of the spiritual and the material world. So that's the group that brought us these papers. And then there's the progress helpers. These are the more spiritual of the midway creatures, the primary again, probably. They are attributed as assistants to various orders of seraphim who function in various special groups on the planet. So that's your midwayers. Midwayers vary greatly in their abilities to make contact with the seraphim above and the human cousins below. It is exceedingly difficult, for instance, for the primary midwayers to make direct contact with material agencies. They are considerably nearer the angelic type of being and are therefore usually assigned to work with and minister to the spiritual forces resident on the planet. They act as companions and guides for celestial visitors and students for the sojourners. Whereas the secondary mid, midway creatures are all, all, almost always attached to the ministry of material beings of the realm. So anything material that has to be done is done by the secondary midwayers. The loyal 100, 1,111 loyal secondary midwayers are engaged in important missions on earth. They are, they, as compared, they are primary associates, they are decidedly material. They exist just outside the range of mortal vision and possess sufficient latitude of adaptation to make at will physical contact with what humans call material things. These unique, unique creatures have certain definite powers over the things of time and space, not accepting the beasts of the realms. Okay. Some interesting side notes here with this. Okay, before we go on. Many of the more literal phenomena associated, uh, ascribed to angels have been performed by the secondary midwayers. When the early 
teachers of the gospel of Jesus were thrown into prison by the ignorant religious leaders of that day, an actual angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. In other words, an angel can do things like that. But in the case of Peter's deliverance, after the killing of James, James was the head of the apostles. He was the administrator, and Peter was the preacher, right? Okay. Uh, in the case of Peter's deliverance, after the killing of James by Herod's order, it was a secondary midwayer who performed the work ascribed by an angel. In other words, that it was the midwayer that let Peter out of prison. All right. In there, their chief work today is that of unperceived personal liaison associates of those men and women who constitute the Planetary Reserve Core Destiny. What's the Planetary Reserve Core dest Destiny? There's about, over a thousand human beings that are assigned, because of their thought adjusters, their father fragment, are assigned as Reserve Core of Destinies. And these midwayers can train these uh, father fragments for emergency situation where they can use these beings in emergencies to do certain chores, okay? It was the work of the secondary group ably seconded by certain of the primary cores that brought about the coordination of personalities and circumstances on Urantia, which finally induced the planetary celestial supervisors to initiate those petitions that resulted in the granting of the mandates making possible the series of revelations of which this presentation is a part. That's how this got started. But it should be made clear that the midway creatures are not involved in any sorbid performances taking place under the general designation of spiritualism. The midwayers at present on Urangel, all of whom are of honorable standing, they did not rebel, are not connected with the phenomena of the so-called mediumship. And they do not ordinarily permit, ordinarily permit humans to witness their sometimes necessary physical activities or other contacts with the material world as they are perceived by human senses. So they normally do not let uh, people see what they're going to do. The adjuster. What's the adjuster? It's the father fragment. It's that fragment of God within each one of us. That adjuster we will eventually fuse with when we get to about the fifth mansion world, and that makes us real sons of God, daughters of God, until the, instead of faith sons of God. So we will actually become part of that adjuster, and that adjuster will be become part of us. We will give it our personality. It will give us its deity so that we become children of God and will live forever. The adjuster of the human being through whom this communication is being made enjoys such a wide scope of activity, chiefly because of this human's almost complete indifference to any outward manifestation of the adjuster's inner presence. It is indeed fortunate that he remains consciously quite unconcerned about the entire procedure. He holds one of the highly experienced adjusters of his day and generation, and yet his passive reaction to an inactive concern toward the phenomena associated with the presence of his mind of this versatile adjuster is pronounced by the guardian of destiny to be a rare and fortuitous reaction. And all this constitute a favorable, co favorable combination, coordination of influences favorable to both the adjuster in the higher affairs of action and to the human partner from the standpoints of health, efficiency, and tranquility. So it's because of this self-acting adjuster this being has that this was able to, to happen. Okay, this is the last paragraph I believe I'm going to go through today, I believe, and then we'll take it up from here uh, doom, tomorrow, I do believe. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. All right, here we go. Timeline as close as, pos as possible. This is from Larry Mullen's book, and I want to leave you with this today on this paragraph or this information. So it prepares you for tomorrow. Uh, I think I'm going to try to do the second half tomorrow and get the other 40 slides. Uh, so stick with me and you'll hear the old story if you listen to both of them. 
All right, timeline as close as possible from Larry Mullen's book. This is where he's combined the first two histories. 1906 to 1908, first contact with a sleeping subject. We cannot be sure. The only thing we know is that uh, William Sadler stated that in 1911, he had the first contact with the sleeping subject. So it was in that period of time. 1906 through 1955, non-material beings, a superhuman intelligence and maturity interface with a group of eventually six mortals for the purpose of providing a religious revelation of epical significance. Okay, this was from 1906 to 1955 when the book was published. Communication was cut off at that point. Okay, no more communications came through. All right. December 1924, the Sadlers prepared a formidable number of questions in response to the professed celestial challenge. Up to this point, the celestial beings had been training the contact commission, preparing them for the papers. Okay. At the end of this period of time, they asked Dr. Sadler to come up with a list of what they considered the most important questions that human beings want to know. Okay, so he took it to a group that Lena Sadler had going called the Forum, mostly women, that were meeting to discuss mental health and that sort of thing. And in one of these meetings, Dr. Sadler told them about what was going on with this these contacts and stuff. And so he asked the people of this meeting to help him come up with a group of questions that they could ask these celestial beings. Okay, and this is the response. From the celestial beings if you only knew what you are in contact with you would not ask such trivial questions <laughs> you would rather ask questions as my elicit answers of supreme value to the human race they literally answered his questions before he even asked them okay that's why they found out they were so trivial so in 1925 30 of the individuals that came to the forum agreed to sign a pledge and the forum officially became a group. The pledge was this. We acknowledge our pledge to secrecy. Reviewing our pledge not to discuss the Urantia revelations or their subject matter with anyone save active forum members and to make no notes of such matter as as is read or discussed at the public sessions and to make not to make any copies of notes or what we have personally read. In other words, uh, to be a group member of this group from 1925 up to 1955, these members had to agree not to discuss it outside the forum and not tell anyone else because the contact commission, I mean, the, uh, the commission revealing the book wanted it to be completely finished before it goes out to public scrutiny. Okay. And they actually read the paper three times before it was actually published in 1955. Okay. So they would read the book, the papers, they would, the celestial beings would elicit the, uh, the response, see how they responded. They would go back, rewrite the paper, and then they would read it again. All right. January 25th, January 18, 1925, the forum, for, forum, this is when they started reading the actual papers. The forum read the first papers. Dr. William and Lena Sadler brought the huge type manuscript to the meeting January 18th, 1925. This is when the first exposure to what would become the Urantia book began. Now notice it says typed manuscript. That means that Christie had to take the written manuscript, type it up. After she typed it up, they would put it in the safe and both and the written manuscript disappeared. Never saw it again. They don't know what happened to it. Okay. Okay. 1935. Now this went on for 10 years, right? 1935, they received part four, all in one piece, 
the restatement of the life and teachings of Jesus by the commission of the Urantia Midwayers, the Urantia book part four. This is the life of Christ. And when they received that, it was not changed. They gave God it, the whole thing in one thing, and then it stayed the same throughout because they already had prepared it many, many, many years earlier. And it's an, uh, another interesting note. Uh, in 1935, they have this in the Urantia book. The sun was is functioning through the period of its greatest economy and will shine on at present officially more than 25 billion years. This is paper 41's uh, section nine, paragraph five. So that, that's just an interesting thing. And this is in 1942. So in 1942, the sun reached its mid phase and will shine on brightly for another uh, 25 billion years. 1942, this is an important date, May 31, 1942, the final meeting of the forum took place. The turnover of forum members was great, and during its period of existence, a total of 486 members had come and gone. This is the 30. It started out 30. There was a total of 486 members between... 1925 and 1942. The last meeting was in 1942 when the commission revealing the book said it was done. Okay, so it was 1940, May of 1942. And at that point, the forum went from being the forum to the 70 in, in study groups. Okay, so the book was not changed after 1942. So it was between 1942 and 1955, they waited for the word to have the book published. In 1950, uh, the Urantia Foundation was established according to a Wikipedia article. Okay, that's where I'm going to start. Next time, I'm going to start with a history of William Sadler himself, and we're going to go through that, and I'm going to go, before I'm finished, I will go through every single section of the book, just give you an overview of that section, and then uh, we're going to talk about uh, how the book was put in the English language, and uh, we'll actually get down here eventually to this is some more about the history. I'm going to go through that and then go through each section of the book, who the authors are and what's in each section. Okay. And then at the very end, I have a link for you to go to our group website. And you can find all this information on that. So thank you for listening. Please come and see us again. I ho hope you'll come back and listen to the second heart half. And remember when we're both, done with both of these we will be doing this all over again from the very beginning in the study group so that uh, people can ask questions you can hear their questions and this might clear up things for you also well thank you for coming uh, like i said please come see us again all right let me stop the recording here